Thank you for tuning in and being here with us and watching us today. This is Church Chat. My name is Pastor Daniel Moore, and I'm here with Keith Leach. Uh, he's a retired police officer, and uh, his family uh, has went to this church. And uh, right now, uh, he is uh, what a bailiff. Uh, I'm a basically? court bailiff. Okay. Yes, pastor. So uh, I think he's with Miamisburg. That's now. correct. Correct. Yeah. And uh, so I'm going to uh, ask him to really share with us today about his spiritual background and, and some of the crises in his life that brought him to Christ. And we're going to see how far this goes. There's other things we'd like to talk about, but if we don't get to those points, we'll have them back again. Uh, so make sure you tune back on part two if we have a part two. Um, can you just tell us a little bit about your spiritual background? Yes, sir. I was a... Uh Born and raised in East Kettering, Ohio, and my mother and father uh, had five children. I was one of five. And my mother always insisted we go to church. So she would take us to a Lutheran church that she joined. And every Sunday we would go and go through the process of church. And my father stayed home. He would drop us off at church after church pick us up. Mm. So we would go to church, and then when you became active in the church, you had to volunteer. So I started volunteering as an acolyte, which is a formal process in the Lutheran church. It's a job that you do as a young man, and you would walk down the aisle, light candles before the formal service, serve communion, and help set up the church building and, and the sanctuary for services and clean up afterwards. Then I attended two years of formal catechism training, learning Luther's small catechism, mm -hmm. Martin Luther's small yes. catechism. At 13, I became confirmed as a adult member of the Lutheran Church, mm -hmm. giving me voting rights oh, wow. and, and certain responsibilities. Mm -hmm. But as a teenager, it, since you're no longer forced to go to church, mm -hmm. you, I felt that I was forced to go to church. I quit going to church. Started working as a young teenager all through high school and college, and most of the work that I did was on Sundays. Mm -hmm. So I didn't go to church. I just quit going to church. I was working in restaurants on Sundays. I uh, didn't have the opportunity to go. So I became a police officer. I went to high school, through high school, got my college degree, got hired by the Moraine Police Department in 1979. Mm. My father actually was getting ready to retire from Frigidaire, opened up a Sunday paper one morning and said, hey, I just got off work as a cook <laughs> on the midnights. And he goes, hey, you know, the Moraine Police Department is hiring police officers. Wow. You got your degree in criminal justice. Yeah. I was led here. Amen. I don't know how, but I was led here and became a police officer in 1979 in this wonderful city of Moraine. Mm. Served for up to four years at this point when I lost a good friend of mine. Uh, the West Carolina Police Department and my friend at the West Carolina Police Department, Fred Beard, they were pursuing some armed robbery suspects on northbound 75. Mm. They crashed in Moraine. My partner and I, John, my best friend, responded, we were there at the scene, and uh, as we were apprehending these robbery suspects, there was actually gunfire going on, mm. robbery and kidnapping suspects. So they had kidnapped a young man and stolen his car. My friend Fred stepped out of his police car and was hit by a semi-truck. Oh. And uh, he was killed instantly, horribly, and I really didn't see it at first. I heard something off to my left, you know, I was, thrilled and proud of myself that I rescued someone right. and made this apprehension with my partner and then I was realized that my best other friend Fred had been mm. Fred and I became very close we backed each other up on calls mm -hmm. even though he was with West Carroll because we're adjoining jurisdictions right. we were always helping each other out small departments not enough people so you're always helping each other out on mm -hmm. hot calls and bar fights and family fights, they would come, you know, we'd help each other out. It's a mutual aid assistance. Mm. After his death and all the aftermath, I became very angry. And I became angry at God. And I blamed God for taking Fred, selfishly from me, but also from his wife and small children. Mm. I was single, no children, no responsibilities, and I felt that God let something bad happen. Mm. So I struggled with it for a year or two afterwards, thinking, this, you know, should, am I going to quit police work? Is this something I really am meant to do? Mm. But then I think I was just overburdened by it, overwhelmed by it. 
had a Bible at home, my little apartment, opened it up and started reading it. And mm. something came over me and said, I love you. And I asked for forgiveness. Mm -hmm. And uh, I felt a peace that I'd never mm. had before. That wasn't my fault. This isn't God's fault. Right. That, you know, you don't know what God's plan is through all mm -hmm. this. But I eventually, shortly thereafter, I was actually invited to a Baptist church. Mm. And uh, it was Miami Shores Baptist Church. Yes. And Thomas Melzoni was yes. preaching. Some people in town knew me uh -huh. because I, as a police officer, you meet people. They invited me to the church. I went several times, this is preaching, went forward and got saved. Amen. Eventually baptized Amen. by Reverend Thomas Melzoni. Yes. Eventually led me to this church. Mm. After I had met my wife and her family, they were attending here. I came here and joined the church. And uh, mm. that's that was my initial spiritual journey. Wow. And from that point on, my life has changed. Doesn't mean there weren't rough spots. Right. And there weren't things that broke my heart as a police officer. Mm -hmm. But I always had that hope mm. that there's Amen. something more than me. There we go. And more than anything in this world. And that's God. Mm -hmm. and, and the sacrifice, not only, but he gave his son mm -hmm. for us. He sacrificed his son Amen. for us. And that's the eternal hope mm. that I've carried ever since. Mm -hmm. Took this tragedy, yes. the sacrifice of my friend, and the burden it placed on me. Wow. And then I finally realized, it's not you, it's not me. Quit thinking about me. Right. You have to devote yourself to something higher and greater Amen. than just you. Yeah. And it refocused my whole plan of being a police officer. Mm -hmm. It really did. Amen. Away from making all the good arrests and all those things to mm -hmm. serving. And that changed my complete focus in police work. Wow. It really did. Well, you know, it's, it's wonderful to see the sovereignty and the providential act of God. I always call it the, the fingerprints or the signatures that mm -hmm. God gives you throughout your journey. I know that you were saying that your, your mother, uh, what, she was a Baptist, you know, mm -hmm. until she met her husband. But she also had that, she was that praying mama, I think you told me. Absolutely. And, she uh, you know, she was on her knees. And I find that to be a commonality. Even when the kids drift away, mm -hmm. they, they always used to, it, it, you know, if the dad's not there, so to speak, mama's there. Right. Spiritually wise, that's what I'm talking about. And then... Uh, uh, Thomas Malzoni listens to our church chat, so yeah, his son. Uh, yeah, yes, yeah. I know him fairly well, and it, it's one. It's just something how God strategically uses situations, circumstances. Not that He caused it. That's you right. know, uh, God doesn't cause evil things or destructive things to happen, but God can use them. And uh, it was through that uh, dynamic uh, crisis in your life that that shook your mortality, mm -hmm. that got you to think about something that's higher than you. You know, and, and I've always heard that, you know, police officers have big egos, but pastors can have big egos too, and politicians can have big egos, egos. but anybody can have an ego issue. Sure. And the, the, uh, the abbreviation of ego, E-G-O, is E, easing, G, God, O, out. And I, I, it's, 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 just, it's just the love of God, how much he chases after us. <laughs> You know, he follows hard after us. You know, his tender mercies and, 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 and wonderful graciousness. And to see him bring you to that point, you know, from your childhood, from your religious background, from a praying mama, to, you know, getting your degree in law enforcement, to uh, getting you to, to meet your, your wife, and then, you know, going to Miami Shores Baptist Church, and then God leading you here. But you made that decision uh, there at the church, and that decision is really what transformed and changed your life. It did. Amen. It did, and no one did that. Mm -hmm. It was God. Amen. God had this plan, I think, from my birth. Right. That I was supposed to be a Marine police officer. And mm -hmm. I think he, he, he put me here for a reason. Right. I would have never met my wife and family. Right. I would have never had these wonderful children that God's blessed oh, yes. me with. I never would have had the friends that I met here. Mm -hmm. And I would never would have had the opportunity to serve here. 
right. and helped the people when I was a police right. officer and a sergeant here in Moraine. Right. Not only the officers, but the people that lived here. Right. I became very fond of them. I mm -hmm. loved them. Um, I missed them. Now mm -hmm. that I've been retired seven right. years, I miss getting in a patrol car, mm -hmm. driving up and down the street, talking to good people. Amen. Right. That is the thing I miss about police. Right. I don't miss not sleeping. Right. I don't miss the long hours. I don't miss the, the horrific things that police mm. officers see yeah. all the time. I don't miss that, but I miss people. Amen. And I miss serving them and helping them. Right. Um, one of the things that I was probably the most proud of, and it wasn't because of anything I could mm. do, was when people experienced personal loss. Mm. Because when bad things happen, people call the cops. Mm -hmm. And when I was able to go and offer them some comfort, not mm -hmm. me, right. but God worked through me to give them some comfort, mm -hmm. I would sit in these houses with people that lost mm -hmm. a loved one and pray with them. Right. Some of their children had died of drug overdoses right. or just a na an accident or something, mm -hmm. and they're hurting. And you know they're going to be hurting, and their life's going to be different forever. Right. The fact that I was there... God was there working through me. Mm -hmm. That probably was the most satisfying part of my entire career. Wow. The, yeah. Regards to the arrests that I made, right. and the bad guys that yeah. I put in jail, and all those things, I think I was able to maybe, through God's power, right. get them moving on, maybe seeing something a little bit beyond that there moment. We go. That's probably the thing. That portion of my job mm -hmm. meant more to me than anything. Mm -hmm. Police officers see within the first week of their job, when they're on their own after their training, as much tragedy as most people see in a lifetime. Oh, I believe it. In the first week. Yeah. When I first got on the Marine Police Department, it was a, the city was vibrant with factories and General Motors and car dealerships and highway. And, you know, there were 40,000 people working here. You police the city of 40,000 people plus the 6,500 people that lived here. Yeah. And that's what you policed. And you had, uh, as a police officer in Moraine, it was very unique, you would investigate anything from a barking dog late at night <laughs> to a multi-million dollar mm -hmm. embezzlement from a corporation. Right. And you were dealing with that kind of stuff mm -hmm. all the time. But you did, though, see a lot of heartache. Mm. People just don't call the police and say, hey, I just baked a cherry pie. Why don't you come over? I just feel like sharing it with you today. Now, believe it or not, in this town, in this neighborhood, yeah. I had some old women oh, in this yeah. town, God rest their soul, they're in yeah. heaven now, that would do that for me. Oh, I bet they would. I yeah. would be driving down these streets and they would flag me over. Yeah. Hey. Oh, my. I remember that. Yeah. Those people I miss very dearly. Mm. They blessed me that Amen. through those 35 yeah. years of police work. But normally you see what's the worst thing that could ever mm -hmm. happen to somebody. Some people, the worst thing it can have is their car was totaled in a traffic crash. Mm. Their life is, is easy enough mm -hmm. to that point. And other people constantly have tragedy and heartache in their life. Mm. And you got to deal with that, and that's okay. Right. I think that's what God does. That's why cops can be ministers, mm -hmm. to, to help people through those moments of heartache, through those yeah. moments of terror and horror mm. that you see. Absolutely. You can see that. And so your ministry really brought fulfillment, not just your career, but it was your ministry, you, uh, of ministering to those people. I always say to my people, the best therapy is ministry. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and when you can minister to others and get your mind off of me, myself, and I, it's something very therapeutic. Although we don't do it for us, right. we as believers, but there's some kind of fulfillment that comes back into that. So I hear that that was that was what made you so fulfilled. It wasn't necessarily, uh, you know, apprehending the bad guys, so to speak, you know, or solving the crime, although that was your job. It was ministering to those that were in crisis. Amen. And yeah. that also included the officers that worked with me. Okay. I can understand that. I had two police officers yeah. in my career tell me they didn't believe in God. Um, Just two. Just yeah, two. Yeah. Most officers know that there's a higher power. Oh, yeah. Most of them understand there's a God. Mm -hmm. They understand that. And I would 
make sure that I let them know that I believe that. Amen. And when they were going through personal troubles at home mm -hmm. or on the job, I would, when I was a sergeant, I would let them come in my office. I would shut the door. Right. I wasn't a pastor. Right. I wasn't a counselor. I don't have that training. Right. But I would let them vent to me and talk to me about yeah. it. And I always told them as they left, I'm going to say a prayer for you and your family. Good. That you're going to get through this. Amen. And I meant it. And to me, that's not me. Right. It was God using my position to help them through those things. Right. Police officers suffer a lot. Oh, they do. They see yeah. a lot of things that, like, again, most people don't see. Yeah. And the worst thing they probably deal with, and I dealt with, was the death of children. Mm. Having to deal with the death of children, whether naturally or by accident or purposefully or recklessly, mm. they see that. And those are the things you carry with you the rest oh, of your life. Oh, yes. You know, I have some relatives that work in law enforcement as well. And I've ministered to a lot of people in all my various churches that worked in law enforcement. And it can take a toll on your marriage yes. and your family. Um, is it that they just can't turn it off when they get home? I mean, what's the dynamics that, that you've been able to at least, I won't say diagnosis, but the lack of a better term, that, that you see is, is the element that cripples marriages and families in law enforcement units. The hours you work are just not normal. Okay. You're working weekends, holidays. You're, mm. In 35 years, I, was, I worked 33 Christmases. Mm. So I was, you're always gone on the normal days. Mm -hmm. And you see so much negativity, some police officers shut down. And oh, they'll shut okay. down their ability to communicate with their spouse. They'll come home from a horrific shift. Or they're a detective, they're investigating a terrible crime mm -hmm. where you have these really traumatized victims. And they go home and they have to then, well, the sink's broken. Oh, yeah. Or, you know, or... Johnny's not doing well in school or something. Mm -hmm. I'm not downplaying those issues, right. but you have to be able it, to switch the, that off yeah. and to try to live a normal life. Right. It's difficult. Some police officers, um, thankfully, there are programs for them now. Mm. Um, after traumatic events, they'll do peer counseling. That's good. And they'll send people yeah. to employee assistance programs. When I first got they didn't have anything like mm -hmm. You know, there was there were no programs out there for police officers. You just dealt with it, because I worked with. When I first started, there was a man that worked here. He was a legend, that was a prisoner of war in World War II. Wow! So he had parachuted into Germany, became a prisoner of war. That's the officers I first came on with. Mm. Vietnam vets, Korean vets, World War. These were big, tough guys. Mm -hmm. You don't show your emotions. Right. They say, Sonny, you'll be okay. Yeah, well, okay, I guess I will. But that's the way they dealt with it. Sonny, right. you'll be okay. But the problem with the job itself is you're doing things that nobody wants you. Nobody wants you there mm. when you're working. Right. Nobody wants to call the police. Nobody wants the police to come to their house or mm. they're at scene of an accident or their workplace or something. Nobody wants that. Right. Most people just get on, want to get off their life, but when you need the police, it's a negative thing. Sure. So, police officers occasionally, some police officers just can't deal with it. Mm. And they go through a high level of divorce and, right. and, and, her. and stre the stress yeah. of the job right. affects everything. Yeah. Now, affects everything. I've always looked, and I'm an outsider looking in, mm -hmm. not saying your family's a glass house, but I've watched. And you seem to have, I, I know it's a typical family maybe, or no, I won't say it's typical for your police officer, but how did you keep your marriage fresh and, and strong and vibrant and your kids um, having some kind of male leadership model in the home? I went home. When I wasn't at work, I was at home. And my wife God love her. Mm -hmm. She was the rock at the house. She made sure the kids were at school, right. doing their homework. She kept a, a house for me, and mm. she got them to church. Right. I worked a lot of Sundays when we were first married. Right. To the end of my career, I finally had Sundays off. Right. The last two years of my career, I got Sundays off. Oh, wow. <laughs> but other than that, she was there, yeah. and she and and I. 
I believe that God took care of me. Mm. I know God took care of me and my family. Right. And because of the peace that I have, I didn't forget the things I went to work, but when I took my boots off, I was done for the day. And I went home to a wife that loved me and in-laws that loved me right. and cared for me. And I had that family structure and I guess that support, the backup that I needed. They were my best backup. Oh yeah. I worked with partners out there. Some of the finest people I ever met were police officers. Mm -hmm. Some of the finest, most decent, hardworking, courageous people I ever met were these cops. Mm. But I got to go home to a loving house. Right. So I was... God bless me with that. Amen. But it wasn't just that. I had to take it upon myself right. to turn the switch off yeah. when I went home. Right. So they didn't see that. Now, I could confide in my family, right. but I never tried to overburden them with go. some of the horrors of it. Mm -hmm. And it's not that every day I went out there was a horror show or something right. like that. But you see sadness every day. Mm. And mm. I think it... With me, it was, I'm so blessed. I'm so lucky. Right. I'll never do anything to jeopardize that. Okay. Nothing is going to get in the way of that for me. Because to me, the family wasn't just, I didn't take them for granted. Right. They were my blessing. Amen. They were my sanctuary. They were my safety. Yeah. And, you know, that's, I would never jeopardize that for anything. So the part of turning it off. And that's always hard for people, especially if people have uh, some mental dysfunction like, um, you know, uh, compulsive, you know, disorders mm -hmm. and things like that. Um, so basically the environment of your home helped you to turn it off. But what else, um, uh, what could you advise us to do? You know, I mean, as pastor, I, I, I don't experience the horrors like a police officer would, but I do go in and people have committed suicide, mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, or, you know, we, or a child has been beaten to death. And, you know, so, I mean, there's some similarities there. Um, but, you know, it, it's hard for a man to let go because he wants to fix everything and he can't fix everything. Um, so the environment, a Christian environment is essential for that. What else? Um, could you maybe advise us in the area of shutting things off and really enjoying um, our family life? Probably just recognize that they're a gift from God for you. Okay. And it's the greatest gift you can have on this earth right. is your family. Right. And there's a certain point, well, you're, one of you is going before the other. Right. You know? There we go. And then I think recognize that right. that things are temporal here mm, okay things are temporal we and go. i i think prayer yeah i think prayer yeah. is the is the is what solidifies that whole great you gotta believe that there's more than this mm -hmm. even though you might be very but we're a very blessed country right Oh, yes. You know, we're very blessed, even though we might have these issues that come up in our personal lives. We're top 1% in the world. Yeah, we're, what a blessed <laughs> world we're living yeah. in. Even though I was in a profession that now people mm -hmm. are not thinking too kindly of. Yes. But that's a small percentage of this world. Right. And the Absolutely. media is portraying that. Absolutely. The people of this town, the, other, the town where I'm working mm -hmm. now, all this area, they're very supportive oh, of their absolutely. law enforcement. I think they understand the sacrifices that they make mm -hmm. and that they're willing, they are perfectly willing to go where other people won't. Right. They have to go, it's like they'll say, you, the cops run towards the gunfire yeah. rather than away from right. it. The normal thing to do is run away from mm -hmm. it or run away from a fire. Right. A firefighter runs into the fire. That's right. not normal. Gotcha. So I think people appreciate that you have, especially this town, mm -hmm. great police officers, firefighters, medics. You have a city fathers that care about the town mm -hmm. and, and, and leaders. And I think you have this spiritual mm -hmm. force in Moraine. Mm -hmm. And I think appreciate it. I remember as a young cop driving around on Sundays and seeing all the churches full. Oh, wow. Yeah. Little churches, big yeah. churches. There were churches with little in storefronts. Yeah. And you would drive around the church park on Sundays. Mm -hmm. Sunday was the police officer's day of rest. Oh, really? Because he knew wow. that 
till the late evening. Yeah. People went to church. There were no bars open. That's true. You could barely yeah. go to the grocery store yeah. and get gas. But people, yeah. Sunday was the day of rest for police officers. Wow. Then. But now That's it's incredible. just, it, you know, yes. you, can, you can see how things have changed. Oh, absolutely. You In the last 20 that. years. It's, or maybe 10 years, if it's, you want to. It's kind of yeah. shocking. It's, it's really. flipping. Yeah. yeah. And, I, you know, I'm trying to, uh, to be as contemporary as I can uh, without compromising my truth, you know. Right. I want to preach an uncompromising truth, but I want to do it in a contemporary way that reaches people because people don't think like they used to. They don't have the backgrounds like people no. used to. So we have to go about it a little bit different. Uh, I shouldn't say a little bit different. Uh, uh, there, it's, we got to make a, a big change in our approach toward ministry and reaching people. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I've always admired police officers. You know, I, in every church, I've had police officers. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I had a, a special division of uh, investigators in Sumter, South Carolina, you know, that um, uh, they researched serial killers, you know. Wow, so, yeah. and I had also police that, you know, policed the town there in Sumter, South Carolina. So I got to, you know, kind of get an inside look, I'll say a, a, a brief glimpse into what a police officer goes through. But, you know, we're living in a world, seems like, of anarchy anymore. Uh, you know, people want to be lawless, and of course, the, the Bible says that, you know, in the last days, people will be yes. like that. So it's a, probably a sign of our time. Um, but, you know, I, I don't understand, um, and a, a lot of it's, you know, just the liberal side of things. I don't understand why people want to shortcut our law enforcement, especially in major cities, because if that happens, you know, the ghettos and the suburbs are, are going to be taken over by gangs and all of that. Um, give us a little bit more of information about how we can uh, counteract that and support the people that are in law enforcement, not just local, but nationally. Well, I think speak up. Um, most good people just stay silent. Right. And they, they're silent and they vote. Mm. And they'll vote and they go about their business and they work and they pay taxes and they mm -hmm. retire and they'll support law enforcement. But I think speak up. And I think the leaders of this country have to realize mm. that if we don't stop, we're headed down the wrong path. Oh, absolutely. And I'm not talking about anything political here. I'm just talking about right. spiritually oh, and oh, morally. Oh, absolutely. The tech, you know, people don't go to school. Right. You know, they, the, the, the COVID thing has kind of turned everything around. Hopefully, that's, I'm praying that's over with. Yeah. We can get back to kids going to school and learning how to read and mm -hmm. write. Here's what I think. And I'm almost 64 years old. Okay. Schools, you should learn how to read and calculate mm -hmm. and write mm -hmm. and speak mm -hmm. and learn the history of this country and things like that. The correct history. The correct, the the correct history yeah. of the country. Church, the, the, when I was growing up, every day we would, when I was a little kid, they said the Lord's Prayer and the Pledge of Allegiance before you start school day. Mm -hmm. Every day I was in a public school. You can't talk about that now. Yeah. You can't even say it. To fly a flag on your property gets some people in trouble. Right. That's crazy. This yeah. United States of America, the most blessed country in the world. Absolutely. We have been given more natural resources and intelligence and good people in this country, but we're turning away mm -hmm. from who's important. Yeah. And that's God. We have turned away from God. And you've seen it. You oh, see absolutely. it more than me. And here's what I learned as a police officer, especially as a Christian, I think I recognize it. It's not just against people or an evil, evil forces. It's a spiritual warfare. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. What you learn quickly is, why is this happening? Why are these people doing evil things? There's a Satan. There we go. And people have denied yes. that there's a Satan. Mm -hmm. We can talk about God, the Father, Son, and Holy mm -hmm. Spirit, but there's also a Satan. There we go. And Satan wants to destroy us. Absolutely. He wants to destroy us as a people, as a country. He wants to destroy our spirit. Mm. And we, police officers see Satan every day. Right. I had a 
guy asked me one time, what was it like being a cop? I said, well, I'll sum it up for you. It, this, I'm not being melodramatic here. It's like I went to work every day and stood outside the gate of hell. Mm. And my job was to keep as many demons in there as I could. Now, the, there's evil going everywhere. I'm, mm -hmm. I, I know I'm being yeah. figure of speaking here. But that's what you face. That's what you battle. Mm. But we all have to battle. We all battle that. Right. There's, you know, the addictions in the world and people doing things to children and exploiting mm -hmm. children. And it, that's satanic. Yeah, it is. It's, an e it's the evil of, that's on this world. Mm -hmm. And you see more and more of it. Amen. And again, I'm not a prophet. You know, I just know what I've heard and read in the Bible. It's those days are coming. Mm -hmm. And you can see it. And it's almost, we're kind of blessed that we see it. Right. And that we know it. Mm -hmm. It's frightening for us. Mm -hmm. It was frightening for me as a former police officer. Right. Not just as a guy out there with a family, with grown mm -hmm. children. Those things frighten me. But I know that I'm going to be okay. Amen. And my family's going to be okay. But we're just going to see a lot of suffering around right. us. And it's interesting you said spiritual warfare. Mm -hmm. I'm beginning tomorrow here at 6.30 a study on spiritual warfare. And uh, one of the things we're going to look at is Ephesians 6, where it says we, we wrestle not with flesh and blood. We tend to think each other, right. and each, you know, it, it, every you know, different political uh, person that difference, that we're our enemies. But the Bible says that we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and ruler of a dark, rulers of darkness and wickedness in high places. So there is that spiritual dimension that I think people fail to see. And it is a very destructive, it's a very deceptive, and it's a very devilish mm -hmm. type, you know. Uh, and and, and it, it, I think we Christians, we, we want to dwell on the positive. I'm all for dwelling on the positive. But you got to address the negative before you can really get to the positive of things. You know, um, we're all sinners. And because we're sinners, we need a Savior. And here's the hope. If I can get you lost, I can get you saved because you realize you need a Savior. So you've got to deal with some negativity, you know, to see what kind of glorious salvation you can get in Jesus Christ. But even with Christians, I think that we say we believe in this, in this demonic spiritual dimension. Because the Bible says he's the prince of the power of the air. And the word air there means atmosphere. He's influencing the atmosphere of the world. And, you know... Um, I just think we Christians sometimes, we say we believe that, but we really need to come into reality more and, and realize we're in a spiritual warfare. Uh, and and you, it was ironic that you said what you thought you were trying to keep as many demons in the door of hell, you know, and, and that is a picture that also Jesus left us when he said, upon this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. So, you know, the gates of hell are opening up on us. Mm -hmm. And especially as we, we go on the last days, the Bible says many shall depart from the faith, giving heed to subducing spirits and doctrines of devils, calling right wrong and wrong right. We see people don't have a moral compass anymore. Uh, people, are not, people are not moral, they're not even ethical, right. you know. And uh, people don't even realize what ethics means. I mean, it's just, uh, 40, 50 years ago, you could go into someone's house and maybe they had not been at church, but they knew they had read the Bible. Uh, they knew about these biblical characters. Now you go into a person's house, well, we can't do it because of the pandemic, and you talk to them, you're going to have to build a foundation. You know, you've got to build a foundation first and then put the walls on, get the roof on, because people are not exposed to the spiritual things like they were, you know, and... But I think you hit the nail on the head when you said it is a spiritual dimension that we've got to notice and confront through the power of God. Yeah. yeah yep. And I, I guess you and I have been fortunate. Right. The professions we were, I can't even say we chose. No, it's a call. I think we were yeah. chose for them. And I'm right. not putting myself on any pedestal. No, I understand. But I... When I was growing up, the only cops I knew were the ones chasing me down the street because I was out too late. <laughs> I had no interest yeah. in that. But about eighth grade, I had this oh, feeling, yeah. I want to be a police officer. Why? Right. Catch bad guys, drive a car fast. I, would, I don't know why, but it, mm. it kept me focused on something. 
Right. And I finally I made that decision with the academy and all that. And mm -hmm. But I think it was chosen for us. Right. But the one, I guess, advantage that we have is mm -hmm. you and I, in this profession that mm -hmm. I used to have, that you are still doing, have to deal with it. And we yeah. see it. God opens our eyes to recognize that a little bit, and then we can deal with it a little bit more. And it gives you the power to preach right. and to minister to people. And that's important Absolutely. because that's what God wants you to do. Mm -hmm. You know, when I go to heaven, I, you know, I always told a pastor one time, if I'm just given a broom closet, I'm good. <laughs> you know? He says, Keith, you've done a lot. No, I haven't. I just, if I have a little broom closet right. up there, I'll come visit you in your mansion, sweep yeah, up and throw a porch for you if you want to. And he told me, he goes, that's yeah. not it. Yeah. That's not it. Right. You do the best you can here. Go. What I found the best thing to do before I would do, I know we're running long here. That's okay. Take a call at someone's right. house. And I knew I had to go help them. Mm -hmm. If I said a prayer in my cruiser, a quick one, before I went in, mm -hmm. things worked out so oh much my. better. Wow. Because it was I wasn't stumped for anything. Yeah. I wasn't stumped to say the right word. Right. I wasn't. But if I just did it, at times I was clumsy. Yeah. Yeah. And I to me, it. that's just an example of God's power. Amen. In a small little Keith Leach, right. helping someone when yeah. I was a cop. Amen. And if I said that prayer, I'll never forget telling somebody. Mm -hmm. If I said that little prayer. Mm -hmm. It was just like it was easy. Mm. And it wasn't Keith Leach speaking. Right. And I would always, because as a cop, you're wearing a badge and a gun, and you're the man. Oh, you are yeah. the man. When you get to the scene of something, you're gonna, we got to calm this down. I'm mm. the guy here. I'm going to solve this. Mm -hmm. Right. That's not it. Yeah. you you got to let something else show there through. There we go. And that's mm. where I was most successful. When I, man. When I took... When I did that, mm -hmm. but if I didn't do that, oh, I made a mess of things. Mm. You know, I just didn't. Yeah. I didn't do a, as good of a job. Right. And yeah. So I sounds great. But you have a. You're you're still in the battlefield. Well, right. You are. Uh, yeah. You're still in the battlefield. Yeah. And I'm not. In our day and age, it's a different battlefield. It's a different it's, battlefield. It's, it's, yeah. <laughs> when I was a kid, as you know, remember, mm -hmm. pastors, priests, men of the. Mm -hmm. of, that were pastors yeah. or preachers, they were revered. Absolutely. And if they told you to do something, you did it. You did it. And if they said, mm -hmm. they said, son, quit running down that hallway at the church, mm -hmm. you did it. There we go. Yeah. I always had that reverence towards police officers mm -hmm. and teachers and principals mm -hmm. in schools. But the pastor of my church, when I was growing up, he was the man. Mm -hmm. And looking back now, what he was telling was the truth. Yeah, right. He was preaching the truth. Amen. He really was. Right. And all the pastors I've had since, the churches, God's put me in churches, mm. I've heard the truth. Good. And I'm very, I'm very God. blessed that way. Yes, sir. And I like it. What you, what you were saying is, even when we, in Ephesians 6, when we put on the armor, at the end, it tells us how to put it on. It says with prayer. Mm -hmm. Prayer brings oil to the gearing. You know, prayer is that unction to function. It's that anointing. That, that special ability that is above your capability. And that's what you're saying, that, that you had God's spirit upon you, that anointing. And when you called on that anointing, you got it. And when you didn't, God taught you what you really needed Absolutely. to do. Absolutely. You know, Absolutely. you really need to rely wholly on him. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's great. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. You know what you said about, I believe um, if, if you're, I believe every career that a person in that's a calling. Uh, you know, you may, may not see your police officer as a calling to ministry, but I see that just as much as a calling of me as being a pastor. And, and you know, I'm a firm believer that it, when you were born, it was not by accident or coincidence or happenstance or one night stand. Not that you were born in one night stand, but you know what I'm saying. God knew you were going to be born in the eons of eternity past. Before there was time, before there was space, before there was a cosmo. I mean, God is foreknowing. And God knew when you would be born. Matter of fact, he put you in the right time for you to be born. Like Esther, her uncle Mordecai said, how, how do you know? You may have been born for such a time as this. So, you know, he, he calls you. He, he births you at the right point. 
Uh, yeah, we might uh, try to circumvent his will throughout our life, but he, he has a pretty good navigational system. Mm -hmm. You know, when we make the wrong turn, he'll tell us, you know, he, he'll reroute us, but he gets us to where we need to go if we really humble ourselves. So, you know, I, I view a police officer as a calling. And, and if your career is really a calling, guess what? You're going to have a passion for it. You're gonna, it's going to be more than, than what you studied for. Right. You know, it's more than developing skills. It's, it's going to be some kind of passion that, that if you weren't doing it, you'd feel like, you know, you were out of place. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, a round hole, you know, square trying to flip it in a round hole. So, you know, I think all of us have callings. But, but to really get that thing going is to have an encounter, a life-changing, transforming encounter with the Lord Jesus Christ, like you had. And I'm, I'm so happy that you got to come, and we're going to have you back and talk about some other things. Too. Absolutely. And absolutely. I had a really, really good conversation. Uh, I hope that you got something out of this. I, I know that um, sometimes we don't hear people's different perspectives. And one of the reasons I'm doing church chat is to try to give you a different perspective. Um, I don't want to preach through it, although I get excited when I hear things. But, you know, I, I want to give you the perspective of, of how people go through various different situations in life. And if you'll notice, out of all the church chats we've done, there is a commonality between um, their uh, existence here on earth, their achievements, their so-called successes. It, 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 they have, they've somehow had an encounter with God through Jesus Christ. And Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. And if you really want to get in circuit with what God has called you to do, and God has created you with a divine plan and purpose, God has a destiny here on earth. He has a destination in heaven to come. And he wants you to be a part of that. He loves you so much that he sent his son to die for you. As, as Keith said, Jesus suffered, bled, and died for us. And if you're out there and, and you've never had that personal encounter with Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord, will you just pray this prayer after me? Uh, you gotta come, it's got to come from the heart. Uh, I'm not trying to force you into religion. I'm not even trying to force you to be a Baptist because you can be a Baptist and not be a Christian. It's not your religion that gets you to heaven. It's a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And so if you would love to have this personal relationship with Jesus Christ, just bow your head. And uh, just repeat after me. Go, dear Lord Jesus, I'm a sinner in desperate need of a Savior. I turn from my sins to you. I open my heart's door. By faith, I receive you into my heart as my Savior. I believe that when you died on that cross, you did something for me that I could not do for myself. I receive your amazing grace, your eternal love, your loving kindness, your tender mercy, your forgiveness, and that full and meaningful life, and that eternal life to come. Jesus, I take me off the throne of my heart and I place you on the throne of my life. I surrender you to you as my Lord and Savior. Amen. If you prayed that prayer, the Bible says that you have been saved. The Bible says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And it's not a hope so, think so, or maybe so, it's a no so reality. The Bible says these things are written to them that believe on the name of the Son of God that they may know that they have eternal life. Now, you're going to see at the end of this church chat an address, and I believe my phone number will be on there. That's a church cell phone. So when you call, I want you to tell me that you've received Christ. When you call, please leave your name. And, uh, you know, while you're calling, uh, why I do that is I get a lot of business calls, uh, and I want to be about the kingdom business. I want to help you. So you leave a message if I don't pick up. Now, maybe you're out there today and, and, and you once had that vibrant relationship with Jesus. You were living in victory, but you kind of just got away from it. You know, you fell away. Maybe you're not involved in bad things. Maybe you're just involved in good things that keep you from God's things. 
Will you just come to God today and reconnect with Him and rededicate your life? Uh, you know that day that you repented of your sins and placed your faith in Christ, surrendered to Him? Uh, he will always love you. And guess what? He will always call you His son and daughter. But sometimes we become prodigals. I, I was a prodigal one time. I've had five kids and some of them have been prodigals. Now the prodigal has come home. I'm asking you if you're a prodigal son or daughter, come home. Come home. And you'll find out that you don't have to ha hang your head in shame. That just like the prodigal son's father embraced him and kissed him and had a party for them, Jesus will welcome you back. He'll kiss you. He'll hold you. He'll put a ring on your finger of sonship or daughterhood and you can regain what you went away from. Just pray this prayer after me. Go, Dear Lord Jesus, I want to come back to you. Forgive me of my sins. Forgive me of my selfishness. Forgive me of the bad things I've done or maybe the good things that's taken me away from God's things. Lord, I want my heart, my whole heart, to be where it ought to be. And you said if we will seek you with our whole heart, that we will be found. So Lord, my heart cries out to you. Here I am, I'm coming home. Forgive me, restore me, and help me to live the rest of my life for you. In the name of Jesus we pray. And amen. God bless you. Thanks for watching. You have a blessed and wonderful day.